If you're not already subscribed to this YouTube channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button now, along with the bell icon so you can be notified whenever a new video is posted. And if you're already subscribed, check and make sure that YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you. And of course, be sure to give the video a like as well as share it on your social media. The white supremacists hate that. And now, the Sunday Address. All right, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the story of the week. Indeed, the trial of the century. Donald Trump has been convicted on 34 counts of, well, basically paying a porn star out of his political campaign coffers and apparently trying to whitewash it over. But regardless of that, I didn't want to talk about it mainly because of the fact that it's not that important to black empowerment, but because there have been a number of people out there outside of the black media who have done some garbage takes on it, I figured that for posterity's sake, there might be some merit in me throwing my two cents into it. All right, let's go ahead and deal with the preliminary issues first. What do I think about this particular case? Not very much and not very often. Now, before I go any farther, I have to say off the bat, I'm not a Trump fan. I have no sympathy or support for the man. This guy spent his entire life being a good little bigot. And on top of that, what's he done for black empowerment? Not much. Sure, he may provide something of a political counterweight to put pressure on the Democrats. But at the end of the day, if you have to drag this man kicking and screaming to do anything on your behalf, that becomes just as big a problem as the Democrats. That said, looking at this from the outside, we all know what this fiasco and the avalanche of litigation against him is really about. The establishment wants Trump gone for a myriad of reasons, and Democrats are looking and going, you know what, we got very lucky in 2020. We had a pandemic that weakened him politically because it undermined the economy, not to mention the collective weight of a lot of his stupid behavior. The Democrats didn't have anybody except for maybe Bernie Sanders, who could have given Trump a run for his money, but they don't like a lot of the things that Bernie Sanders has been saying and positions he's been taking. So from the actual people who the Democrats would be willing to put on the ballot— they didn't really have anybody other than Biden who could compete against him. And if it wasn't for how the economy went sideways in 2020 due to the pandemic and all of the chaos that it wrought, Joe Biden would not have won that year either, just like he failed the other two times he tried to run for president. So that's what things are about from the Democrats' side of the ledger. The Democrats are very much desirous to make sure that the orange man doesn't get back into the White House, because if he does, he's going to be politically vindictive as hell. But the Republicans also can't stand Donald Trump. They couldn't beat him either. See, they thought that they had gotten rid of this man in 2020. You had idiots like Joe Scarborough saying that Donald Trump wasn't necessarily gone, but Trumpism was. And I'm sitting here listening to this crap and going, you know what? This is why only baby boomers listen to the white broadcast media and actually put any stock in what they say. Because Scarborough, as with so much else, he was wrong on both counts. Neither Trump nor Trumpism was gone. And history has certainly borne that one out. So Joe Scarborough has shown everybody just how astute a political observer he is. But the problem was when Donald Trump got beat in 2020, he didn't slither away and crawl back under a rock. And that being the case, they decided, OK, then we're going to make his political demise permanent by any means possible. The plan is pretty transparent because they want it to be. The idea is to bury him under a mountain of litigation. Go ahead and drain his campaign treasury and hopefully wear him out by the election because he ain't no young man. And being under all of this pressure is not good for the health of a guy who already is obese and ain't in great shape to begin with. Now, what are the chances that this is going to result in him going to prison now that he's been convicted for this? If I was a betting man, I'd say that he's not. He's a first-time non-violent offender. And just to show how much of a stretch this all has been, half a dozen legal experts who talked to Reuters said that it's very rare for defendants convicted of the kind of crime he was to get prison time in New York. In fact, it's rare for those kind of defendants to get prison time, period. Mainly because of the fact that this is not exactly a high crime. This is not the kind of thing that necessarily you throw the book at people for. What usually happens is they pay a fine. But in Donald Trump's case, who knows? The judge in this case might decide to swing for the fences and actually give Donald Trump some sort of incarceration time or another, mainly because the judge happens to have ties to the Democratic Party. There are a number of questions about the judge and other aspects of this case that could provide Trump the basis for a successful appeal. But that's going to be slow going. I'd say whether he can get this conviction overturned or not depends on how quickly he can get this case before his Supreme Court. I say his Supreme Court because he put half of them on the bench. But you can bet Democrats and the never-Trumper contingent of the GOP will do everything they can to drag that process out. This is about politically purging the landscape of somebody who had been problematic for both of the major parties for different reasons. And make no mistake, the Republican establishment is glad that this happened. Donald Trump's been a big problem for them, too. They're not up in arms about this. 
Have you noticed that? Sure, Mike Johnson will croak out a few impetuous remarks. They'll make a couple of the right-sounding noises, but in reality, the GOP leadership is by and large glad that this happened. Why? For the same reason as the Democrats, because the Republicans were not able to beat Trump either, but they had another bone to pick with Trump that even the Democrats didn't have. You see, Donald Trump successfully turned the GOP's own base against them, something he couldn't do with the Democrats. The Republican leadership was humiliated by the fact that this guy was able to crap all over them. Hell, he was publicly taking a dump on lifers like John McCain and others, and the GOP's own voters sided with Trump against them. See, part of being a politician in the United States is that your voting district is basically your own little political fiefdom. You're basically a king in charge of your own little domain. So when somebody shows up out of the blue and proves they can come into your house and turn your subjects against you, this after decades of you being solely in charge, the powers that be don't like that. This is all about having guaranteed outcomes, and Trump became a wild card and they didn't like it. And he was able to do it so easily. I've been saying this for years now. The never-Trumper contingent of the GOP is far larger than people think. A lot of these Republican politicians who have been pretending to not be against Trump, or even the ones who are pretending to like him, they were doing it because they were terrified of the fact that this man could inject uncertainty into their political races. When these guys run for re-election, the last thing that they want is Donald Trump coming out of nowhere and saying, this guy, he's not with me, somebody should primary him. Sure, even if they can beat him, that's fine, but nobody wants to actually have to chew their fingernails and bite their fingernails off, wondering if they're going to get beat. Everybody just wants to coast to re-election. That's what being in office is about, the power of incumbency. It's not supposed to be a long, hard slog to get re-elected. It's supposed to be a fait accompli. You're supposed to show up, file your re-election paperwork, and then you just wait until voting day when people vote for you. It's like, all right, back to office again. That's what it's supposed to be. And Trump made it where they couldn't depend on that anymore. And they didn't like that. It was not business as usual. I'm not talking about business as usual that benefits black people. I'm talking about this is strictly from the outside. This ain't got nothing to do with us. See, they tried to dogpile him with establishment tools like Ted Cruz and Jeb Bush, but they got crushed. Then they tried to reverse engineer their own phony version of Trump light, like Ron DeSantis. But GOP voters weren't fooled by him either, and they sent him packing, not that he ever truly had a chance to begin with, and I told you about DeSantis from day one, he didn't have a chance. It was obvious that this guy was going to fail. So nothing that the GOP establishment or their rich donors threw at Trump worked. And once he became the standard bearer for the party, now they were in a real fix. They couldn't openly be out there trying to take him down. So the question for the GOP leadership was, how do they restore the old status quo, but without turning their own voters against them? Because if you go against Donald Trump, enough of those rubes out there over the Republican base are going to turn on you. So how do you thread that particular needle? How do you dance on that particular pinhead? The answer? You don't. Instead, you let the Democrats do it for you. So that's the reason why you haven't seen the GOP running around with their hair on fire after this verdict. See, a lot of them, they were expecting this. They were counting on it. They're perfectly content to let Trump swing in the wind and let the Democrats beat him like a drum repeatedly. Look at how muted and tame the GOP's response to this has been. You would have thought these guys would be out here threatening Armageddon, but they're not. Because to a big extent, Donald Trump has also been a thorn in their sides too, and they much prefer the way things were before he came along. This is about restoring the old status quo. And once more, for the people who don't listen, I'm no Trump supporter. I'm just telling you the political realities. As Dr. John Henry Clark said, World Wars I and II were nothing more than an argument between a couple of thugs about which one of them was going to rule over us. And the same thing goes for the Cold War. This is how white supremacy argues amongst itself. And the same principle applies here. This is a political argument between white centers of power vying to see which one of them is going to have the upper hand. And yes, the competition does become cannibalistic and quite brutal, but that's what happens when you're fighting for power at the highest levels. Donald Trump was obnoxious and annoying, but he was to an extent tolerable until he began making enemies out of lifelong politically entitled people. So that's just a roundabout way of saying, no, the enemy of my enemy is not my friend. Under white supremacy, it don't work that way. Speaking of which, what does this mean for black people? First of all, Democrats are going to take this as an opportunity to say they don't have to do anything for black people now. Why? Because, why, buddy? We put these charges on Trump, buddy. You remember how racist he was when he was president, don't you? Hell, you remember how racist he was before he was president. So that's what we did for you. We, we, we took down Donald Trump. We did it for you niggers because, uh, you know, we like you guys. So now go to the polls and vote for us. 
So once again, Democrats have given themselves a gift, but then they turn around and say that they were actually doing it for us. And they'll have the usual assortment of bootlicks, tethers, and suck-up Negroes who are going to be screaming, That's right! Democrats ain't got to do nothing for me! They got the orange man out of office, and they put them charges on him, and they got him convicted, and that's good enough for me. He gets to seize what it's like to be blacks in America. Here's the thing. While it is true that Donald Trump is definitely, if nothing else, tasting some of his own karma, especially where black people are concerned, yes, he cheerleaded for black people to be incarcerated and a million other things. That being the case, sure, I have absolutely no problem with Donald Trump being on the business end of a prosecution. I have no problem with that at all. But don't tell me that they've been doing this for black people's benefit. They've been doing this only for their own. Because what are black people going to get out of this? Alvin Bragg certainly won't be getting much political capital out of it. But if Letitia James brings her case and nails Trump too, then they'll talk about her like she's the second coming, but they'll only be doing that in the hopes of getting black female voters to be swinging toward the Democrats. That's what they'll be doing, playing the same old games. And I don't think I have to tell you about Fannie Willis. We don't need to be naive or deceived about what's really going on here. This is the same old jockeying for position within the political structure, people who are trying to climb that ladder, and this is part of how they try to do it. The big question from the left corner of the white media has been, how is this going to affect Trump's campaign? In reality, he's going to take a brief hit to his numbers, but as for whether or not this will sink his campaign, it's going to depend on how this goes in those battleground states. And while polls allegedly show, according to the white media, that there's Republican voters who have said that if he does become a felon, that this will affect whether or not they choose to vote for him, it's also true that there's a lot of people who claim that they wouldn't vote for Trump, but come election day, they do it anyway. For a lot of folks in this country, Trump is a guilty pleasure. He brings a lot of baggage with him. And because of that, there's a lot of folks who like him and support him, but they're embarrassed to say so because of all the obnoxious stuff that he does. His shameless racism and shooting off his mouth and all of his vulgar comments, that may endear him to a certain segment of the population, but for others, especially political moderates, they still feel some kind of way of actually admitting to supporting him. Hypocrisy is America's cardinal sin. Trump understands that even if the white media doesn't. So the idea of how many people who will vote for Trump as opposed to those who are willing to openly say so, those are two different things. Trump understands that reality. Clearly, the Democrats' plan is to sink Trump's campaign by using these prosecutions to weigh him down. Now, whether or not that works, they're going to need more than this conviction to do it, mainly because this conviction hardly rises to the level of a high crime. It's much closer to a misdemeanor. And for a lot of people, they don't understand it. They don't even understand what was so important about bringing a prosecution based on this. All they heard was that he paid off a porn star. That does not rise to the level of a felony in people's minds. And when you say, well, it's where he got the money from to do it and how he lied about it, to the vast majority of voters and certainly the overwhelming majority of Republican voters, that's going to come off more as a morals crime, not something that he actually should have been dragged into court about. So if the Democrats are hoping that these prosecutions are eventually going to weigh him down, they're going to need to do more than this. But as we already see, they've got plenty more cases waiting in the wings. So this is not going to be a one-off. And that's going to be a problem for Trump long term, because while with this case, he is unquestionably a first-time nonviolent offender. The problem is that they go ahead and put some more felonies on him successfully. Well, at that point, then he becomes a two-time convicted felon. And that's where the possibility of him going to prison really comes into play. I'm sure that for Trump, the most important thing is to actually make it to the Republican convention because it's going to be a coronation for him. He doesn't have any competition. But also beyond that, he's going to have to try to hold together whatever political support that he has long enough to actually make it to Election Day. That's where the problem for the Democrats comes in. You see, when people go to the polls, they don't vote against someone. They have to vote for something. There's no place on the ballot that says you can go ahead and vote against this guy, but it doesn't take any votes away from someone so over here or add any votes to someone else. No, you got to vote for something at the polls, not against it. And that being the case, Joe Biden's numbers are already underwater and this conviction has not turned them around. Just because you hurt Trump's numbers doesn't mean that you help Biden and Biden needs his numbers to go up. It's not enough for Trump's numbers merely to go down. This has not translated into a rise in the polls for Biden. In fact, things have stayed the same, precisely because Biden is president and Trump's not. This is seen by a lot of people, especially in the political center, as being a political sideshow going on with Trump. It won't become serious until after the convention. And even then, they're going to be asking, has Joe Biden made our lives better? These are the lengths that the political establishment is willing to go to in order to try to preserve itself. But Donald Trump made the exact same kind of mistake that Joe Biden did. 
When it came time for him to make a deal with black voters to get our support, he instead decided that he too didn't have to do that. Trump, like the Democrats, tried to see if he could get by with mere lip service. Yes, a lot of these non-black people of color who had been making nice with white supremacy all these decades did catch a little bit of hell from him while he was in office. But at some point, we have to see our own position improve in order for that to translate into supporting Trump. It's good that people get their wake-up call and all that. I'm all for it. But this is about whether our fortunes improve, not so much whether someone else's goes down. Donald Trump promised us nothing, and he kept his word. So I say we support him the exact same way he supported us. If he had spent his four years in office going to black communities and spelling out the tangibles that he would bring, he could have swum black support his way. Instead, he decided to attack the black community, and he antagonized the very people who he needed to stay home. See, the only reason he became president in 2016 was because black voters had been disgusted with the neglect and the abuse from Obama, and they were ready to vomit at the prospect of a Hillary Clinton presidency because they knew that it would be Bill Clinton 2.0. So those black voters decided, hell, we're staying home, which is exactly the scenario the Republicans need if they're going to win office. They need black voters in specific to stay home because we are the base of the Democratic Party. We're the strongest voting bloc that they have, the most dependable by far. And make no mistake. When it comes to these so-called battleground states, the white media is not really talking about the states at all. Most states in the U.S. are red states. What the white media calls blue states are actually red states with large blue cities within them. Michigan is, well, was a red state, but the main reason that it's blue at all is because of Detroit. Georgia's a red state, solid red, but it goes blue occasionally solely because of Atlanta. That's what makes the difference between whether it's red or blue. Pennsylvania is another red state. That racist Cajun James Carville said it himself, quote, Pennsylvania is Philadelphia in the east, Pittsburgh in the west, and Alabama in between. And he was right. It's Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, the two black enclaves that makes Pennsylvania a blue state. And Florida, by the way, also occasionally can swing in a blue direction, but it's because of Miami-Dade. And that's the only reason why Democrats are even able to exist in that state. Trump made a political calculation that he could shore up his black support during his presidency, but do it without actually offering us anything. And what he found out was, there's some Negroes who are willing to go to the White House and take a photo with them, but when it comes to the actual grassroots support, he has to show up with tangibles. And instead, he showed up empty-handed. And now he's seen what kind of support empty hands gets you. So, will this conviction drag down Trump's poll numbers? Actually, I don't think so. Even to the voters in the swing states, this all comes off more as he got convicted for paying off a porn star. And given what people already know about Trump, there's no surprise there. Now, apparently there's supposed to be more litigation against Trump as we get closer to the election. I think that's a horrible strategy for the Democrats. Dogpiling Trump has already gained him support and sympathy from people because a lot of people are looking at this and going, wait a minute, he can't be this bad. That's what's happening with a lot of those moderates and certainly with the right wing. And to put Trump on trial right before the election, especially if you do it even after the convention, after he gets the nomination, that's going to be largely interpreted by the public as the Democrats attempting to put Trump in prison because they don't think they can beat him at the polls. I think it's obvious what the Democrats are hoping for is that with all this pressure being put on Trump, hopefully he'll have a public meltdown as if he hasn't done that before, or that he's going to crack. But the truth is, Donald Trump does a much better job of composing himself than people have given him credit for. He actually has more discipline than people would like to believe. But that hasn't kept him out of trouble largely because of the fact that the man keeps making too many of the wrong moves. He's certainly made too many of the wrong enemies. But continuing to try to drag this guy into court day after day, especially for the remainder of this year, that's going to backfire. People are going to be looking at this and saying Democrats clearly don't think that they can beat this guy and this is what they're doing. The sad part is that to a large degree, this perception is accurate. But then again, this is my view from the outside looking in. Call me when someone wants to talk about something that will actually empower black people. Good evening and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Eric Bailey, Deborah Martinez, Masby International, Javier, and Rowan Wings. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black empowerment only exists because of you.